Hey Floss Tube friends, it's Laura from Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. I thought I'd share how I prepare my cross stitch pieces for framing. Um, so saving a little bit of money by doing some of it myself. And uh, my mom had given me a dimensions kit called Village Serene that I completed about a month ago. Um, and I mentioned in my last video that I had experimented with a couple kinds of gridding and so I used a water soluble pen for the first time which is what you're seeing there in blue on the right side of the design and so I'm really hoping this pen is going to come out. I've heard other people commenting some of the pens sometimes don't come all the way out or they come back with heat so um, and that's why you're only seeing it on half. The other side I did stitching uh, regular stitching. So after a bit of agitation, I can see it's coming out quite nicely. Very relieved about that. Um, and so just giving a bit of a another uh, swish around. And then a good rinse under the sink. And just cool water, really. Um, and then a gentle wringing to get rid of the excess water. Um, I don't want to twist or you know, accidentally pull out any of the stitches or the back stitching or anything like that. So I'll just put on a towel and just roll it up and that will allow me to squeeze out the excess water and that gets most of it out. Um, so just giving it a really good squeeze there. And then uh, once I've got that um, all squeezed out, it's just going to sit flat to dry. Uh, and then once it's dry, it's uh, it's some kind of a linen. I can't remember exactly what I stitched on. Um, so it is uh, needs a high heat setting and uh, definitely some steam. Very very wrinkled. Um, not so not so concerned about the far edges, but right next to the stitching, I want to get that as flat as possible because you'll you know that's the part that you might see. Um, so I'm just being very careful to go around it with the iron. I don't want to compress the stitches and kind of squash them down at all. And I mentioned in my last video that you can use a pin board, which is I guess the proper way to do it, which I don't have one of those and I don't do enough, um, enough to uh, warrant getting myself a, a pin board. I, I don't know, I tend to make practical decisions. So a uh, steamer with a little bit of spritzing with the iron and then just kind of going around it gently. Um, and some of those wrinkles will also come out with um, with just stretching it over the, uh, the foam board. So giving it a good press and my iron, you can see it's kind of uh, blopped a bit of water here and there. Um, and I'm trying something that one of my, uh, one of the folks in the comments suggested. Uh, she said, try, Kathy said to try flipping it over on some towels and pressing the back. And I was a little nervous about this. Again, I didn't want to squash the stitches. So I'm trying to be as gentle as I can and just kind of get that the openings there in the cloud area, the unstitched parts to loosen up. And uh, I couldn't tell, they did look like they were maybe getting a little flat. So I just kind of realized I didn't need it in the end too much. So I just flipped it back on over and it's mostly full coverage. Um, but also with uh, the spritzing and, and the steam from the iron that uh, kind of dampened the fabric again uh, with just a gentle stretch in both directions evenly that actually does a really nice job of pulling out a good chunk of the the little wrinkles in there and also it was just a little bit off in my stretcher um, which is fine it, it comes out it's come out quite nicely if it was a really big piece I would definitely want to make sure I had even tension around it so I've got it ready now to uh, decide what size of foam board am I going to use. So I measured my piece to kind of see what's the finished area. And there's a few ways I can go with this. I could go with just a frame, no matting at all. I can, um, you know, have a, a smaller frame that's just the area of the stitching, which is about five by 10. Uh, this is the foam board that I got from Michaels here in Canada. Uh, they have a nice acid-free mounting board so you won't get like yellowing with your fabric over time. So I'm just trying to figure out what size to cut it. So I've taken my rule and I thought I'd like to kind of eyeball and see what it would look like with different amounts of space around it. So uh, I thought well I could go with um, something that's just 
you know, no, no mat at all and just a little bit of space around the stitching. So this is me kind of figuring it out here on a piece of paper off to the side. This is how I tend to do it when I'm thinking about what size of board should I go with. And if you're doing custom framing, it's not a big deal, right? Because they'll just, um, they'll build the frame to the piece. But what I was thinking I'd like to try and do is go with something that if there's an off the shelf frame that I can get and maybe save a bit of money, uh, I thought, let me just see what that might look like as well. And if that's the case, maybe I'll just cut the board to the actual size of the frame. So I'm eyeballing what that looks like with like, uh, a, a seven by 12. And then I thought, well, what if I add like a couple of inches around the edges and that would be more like a 14. And then I thought, ooh, 10 by 14 is a standard size. So if I did that and then I just had them custom cut the mat, then the frame is off the shelf and the stitching uh, stretch stitching is done by me. So I thought, okay, let's go with a 10 by 14. So I'm just marking up my board uh, to the right size and then grabbing my little um, X-Acto knife or my uh, box cutter blade uh, to, to cut that down to size. And mine's a little on the dull side. Uh, if you have a nice sharp blade and you apply even pressure, which I could have done a better job here, it won't be quite so higgledy piggledy at the edges there. A little, a little bit rough. That's not too big of a deal. Um, you can kind of just smooth it over with your hand a little bit, brush off the, the bits, um, or even a little bit of sandpaper, light sanding on the edge. So then I start stretching. And so I'll start on one side and I'll start in the middle on all four sides just to kind of figure out how, how far am I going to stretch it. And so I'll kind of pin it initially and take a look at it, flip it around to the other side, pin it on the other side, and then same thing, uh, try and eyeball it and see if I kind of get it about even. Now, depending on how precise you want to be with this, you could actually measure it ahead of time and mark it. But this is just this is just kind of how I've been doing it. So I'll do my initial pinning on all four sides. And these are um, stainless steel, just um, just straight pins for sewing. Uh, so I'll get a container of those with the idea that uh, they will be part of the piece when it's finished. I just leave my pins in. So I'm just kind of checking and seeing, all right, what do I get for a border? Is it even? It will be a little, uh, a little different from two sides, the, the two sides versus the top and the bottom. Uh, just because again, I'm aiming for a 10 by 14, which isn't an exact match on a five by 10 piece. So, so I'm just moving my pins. So I realized I didn't have them quite evenly spaced. and giving it a pin and then just checking again and making sure that I'm happy with the, um, the space. And so then what I'll do is I'll usually start with about, uh, you know, three or four pins on all four sides, just giving it the same stretch. And I'm looking at the thread. So it's easier with Ada than it is with a linen. The linen, sometimes it's a little hard to see exactly where that line is. When I was doing this about 20 years ago, it was a little easier, but of course, with my eyesight having changed, uh, I, I've got, you can see I've got my reading glasses on to do this. And so I'm just kind of setting some initial pins because I want to see where is that going to fall with what line I'm going to use. So 
So I'm just pointing out that again, how hard it is to see that little um, thread that's part of the, the linen fabric that I'm stitching on. And that's my guide to follow along the edge to make sure that as I'm stretching it, I'm stretching it evenly. If you just, you know, grab it and pin it and you don't stretch it evenly, what'll happen is when you, if you are using a mat, especially you'll, you'll see that your design is not evenly stretched all the way around. So something like this, I like to just give myself a little guide. So I just go in with some regular thread and I'll just stitch um, some stitches along the row that I'm following. That's what I'm gonna, uh, that I'll align to pull uh, snugly all the way around. So I'll kind of just find out where that thread is, take the pins out, I'll stitch my little guide all the way around. And this is something I wouldn't have done you know, a few years ago, but uh, I'm starting to realize that I prefer to have something done right and live with that rather than kind of, you know, well, sometimes I'll wing it, but I try as much as possible to uh, make it look nice, <laughs> especially since my mom gave this to me, right? So I'm experimenting a little bit with the camera settings as well. Uh, trying a time lapse, which I actually kind of like, especially for this part where I'm just, you know, you don't want to watch me stitch all the way around. So that was kind of cool. I like that. I'll probably do that again. And then next is lining it up. So using that guide as the edge, just kind of getting those pins back in place. Uh, around the piece again starting from the middle and working my way out and that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna pin it I'm gonna stretch it I'm gonna pin it again and just kind of keep going all the way around so I'll try and give you a bit of a, a close-up of this so you can kind of see how I've got the guide um, the stitching guide lining up with the edge as I pull it over and pin it. And working my way out from the center. And then what I'll do, of course, is uh, once I've got those pins in place, I'll flip it over, I'll go to the other side. And you're just pushing them straight in, like straight down, so it's buried within the foam core, uh, within the foam board. Again, using the guide stitching along the edge to kind of help me <laughs> eyeball it and put my pins in place. And that's about how far apart I put my pins. Again, starting from the center and working my way out so you can see how easy it is if you did take the time to put a little row of thread as your guide it just makes it i find it just makes it so much easier now sometimes you'll be pinning and the pin goes off a little bit. I'm working at a kind of a funny angle because I'm trying to get this on the camera so you can see it. And so if that happens, just pull it back and pop it back in again and just make sure that it's uh, that it's not poking out uh, either to the front or to the back. You want it straight down as you put these pins in. It takes a little bit of practice, I found. The first few that I would do, there was always, you know, one or two. And even now, uh, there's always one or two that will go a bit too far forward, a bit too far back, and then I'll just pull them out again. There's another one. <laughs> I'll just pull them out and reposition them and put them back in and then just kind of keep going. 
Now I work from the center out. That's just how I learned. Um, I have heard other people who work from the corners in that would work just as fine as well. I, I think, you know, as long as you're not starting from either the right or the left and working across, because if you get to the end and you realize that your tension was off, it's a lot harder to adjust. Um, so, uh, gosh, back in the, back in the nineties, uh, I lived in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, and I took a little, uh, framing class. There was a place down on, oh, John Street, I'm going to say, and it was a framing center, but they offered little classes or maybe it was a workshop where you kind of learned how to do your own and they just gave you all the tools. And I was, I always like to learn stuff like that. Um, and it's a good idea to check as you go along and just make sure that your corners are matching up, that you haven't pulled it too far to the left or too far to the right. So after just a few pins that I've set, I am realizing that I've pulled it too far to the right. So the nice thing is because I only have a few pins in, I can just yank those out and just give it a little... Um, shift to the fabric a little bit over to the left, get it centered properly and then um and then go again and maybe this is uh i don't know i haven't tried actually working from the corners in maybe i'll try that on my next piece but uh maybe that's what some people are thinking right now and saying no this won't happen if you start at the edges i'll have to try that and compare it so just doing a little repinning and then carrying on with the piece And that's it. So you just keep uh, tugging up uh, gently and getting that stitching, that row of stitching to match along the edge and popping your pins in there at the end. And you just kind of work your way around doing that continuously. And I realized, of course, I as I started to pull and I started to get a little further from the edge, I had to use a bit more force with it. I realized that I probably gave it just a bit too much stretch. I was eager to pull those wrinkles out. So I tend to give it, I tend to overstretch, which is also not so good. Um, it's best to have enough tension to pull the wrinkles out, but, uh, you know, not distort your, your stitching. So, and then again, that's just, that's just a bit of experimenting. Continuing on. Pinning and tugging and pinning and tugging. Yeah, in hindsight, I could have done a little time lapse with this. I was struggling with my method of filming. I am looking for a better method. Uh, that's kind of a new thing for me this year is learning how to do the filming and what are some better techniques. So one thing is you will find that if you have a lot of pins to set, um, your finger may get a little bit sensitive getting that sort of indentation in the same area it can get a little sore after a while. If you have uh, something that I don't, I just have band-aids. So I just pop a band-aid on while I'm doing this and I just take it off again. Just gives me a little extra padding to push the pins in with. If you have like a, a thimble, um, I've seen, uh, I've seen the leather thimbles that are out there, or I'm not sure if it's leather. <laughs> they're a little friendlier on your finger. So it is probably a good idea also just to have um, a couple of band-aids handy as well. If you happen to, <laughs> if you happen to um, poke yourself while you're stitching, you don't want to get any blood on the fabric. And sometimes the pins will just kind of bend if you don't you know, put them in, right in that straight angle. So I'll usually bend, you know, a few of those while I'm stretching one of my pieces. Yeah, I probably could have given it just a little less tension than I did. Having to really tug it there.
Also, sorry for the uh, over brightness. The sun came out while I was working and I didn't notice until I started to edit the video. And once you start getting to the corners, you'll want to kind of go back and forth from the one side to the other, put a couple of pins in and then uh, turn it. And this is where you'll find out how was your tension. I did find that most of my tension was pretty good. There were a couple spots I could have done better. But in the end, it's not so off that you'll see that when, um, I guess we'll find out when I take it to get a mat cut for it. And I just pin um, just about right to the edge. And I, I do like to lace the back as well, um, just to tidy it up so it's not flopping around. Uh, a lot of people don't do this and that's okay too. Um, other options are if you want to just use some tape, uh, like a little bit of masking tape, you can tape it to the board. I have done that in the past. The edges are usually so far away from the work that any yellowing that's going to occur Really, it's kind of in the back, not on the, the piece that you would actually see, usually. Um, I'm sure there will be archivists out there who correct me, uh, but that's kind of my attitude is, you know, you do what works for you, what's going to get that up onto your wall so you can enjoy all your hard work. So I decided I would just lace it, and this, this was just an experiment um, when I first started doing this, and it is a little um, cumbersome with the threads kind of going all over the place, but what's nice is it's not an exact science. So it's not like when you're actually stitching your pattern, you just kind of throw your thread in wherever. Um, just watch as you're stitching, it will kind of sometimes get caught with that really long thread um, on the pins, and you don't want to pull your pins out. So if it catches, just kind of gently untangle it. And so I just kind of lace um, from one side to another um, fairly evenly. I like to take fairly big bites with the needle to kind of uh, move it along. So if you have your stitches too close together, you're going to do a lot of, a, of threads back and forth. And then you can tug as you go um, just to kind of snug up the part that you were just on and see if you can get another stitch in there or if you need to uh, attach another thread. And that's all I do is I just knot more thread when I run out. I'll get another length that I think I can work with without getting it too tangled and keep going. Um, I have seen or at least I haven't seen it, but I have heard other floss tubers um, instead of lacing or instead of taping, they've been doing uh, what's called flat folding, and I don't know enough about it yet. That's on my to-do list to check out. And I think that's just really where they're leaving the edges kind of loose behind the frame. And there's nothing wrong with that either. It's just, um, it's just your personal preference, I think, and how, you know, how how much you want to put into it or how in my case how much is your need for tidiness <laughs> when you're finishing up your piece and then i'll just kind of keep going to the end and then each time i get a new thread i'll sort of snug it up a little bit and then when i get to the end i'll kind of give it a snug and hang on to the thread and then i'll uh, I'll do a little knot there to kind of finish off the one direction um, before turning it and starting in the other direction. And you can decide how you want to do your corners. At the corners I just did a few little extra stitches, just a little whip stitch to kind of hold down that, that edge a little bit. Just so it's a bit flatter in the back. Um, so when you put it together you don't have too much that you're trying to compress or things getting um, snagged. So it turned out pretty good. I'm mostly happy with it. Um, my tension probably was a bit much. Um, so it is off in just a couple of spots, but for the most part, I'm pretty happy with it. The guide threads, uh, if you are gonna put it right into a frame with no mat, you can take those right out. 
uh, so that they're not seen in the frame. I was trying to decide whether I should pull my thread or not. Should I? You can tell me in the comments, pull the thread or don't pull the thread. <laughs> and then the last step was I just like to put a little saran wrap on it to protect it and now we're ready to go shopping for a frame. I hope you found this helpful or entertaining or a little bit of both and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks everybody!